Jesus declared that his disciples would be his witnesses, even to the ends of the earth. Yet today, we struggle to even witness to those closest to us, to say nothing of those at the end of the earth. But we cannot reach the ends if we are not reaching at all. But our early forebears lived out this proclamation in powerful and palpable ways. Drawing from the book of Acts, we can see the various ways this gospel witness is shared. And we too can share. We too can witness, even to the ends of the earth. So um, here's the deal. Uh, we are going to look at Acts 25, verses 1 through 12, and we are going to unpack what's happening here. Paul's second trial before a dude by the name of Festus. Fun fact, don't name your baby Festus, all right? Biblical names are great, Festus, not so much. Uh, now, this second trial takes place in verses 1 through 12. Uh, so we're going to go ahead this morning. We're going to see what we can learn from this text and apply to our lives. Um, as we do this, I want to focus on four particular points that are absolutely unrelated to each other. The four points we're going to look at do not build upon each other to some grand overarching um, um, theme. Not at all. These are all uh, unique independent points that we're going to look at, but I, I want to look at them because one, they naturally come out of the text, and two, I believe they're highly beneficial for all of us, very scripturally and biblically based, so there's no reason why we shouldn't take some time to look at them. Uh, my hope for all of you guys this morning is that you're going to leave um, with a, a good application of these four points, meaning that you're going to leave with a fear of remaining unrepentant in your sin. You're going to leave today with an ability to have peace when you're attacked for your faith. You're going to leave today with a knowledge of why accusations will happen and how to better prepare yourself for them when they do. And lastly, I hope that you leave today uh, trusting that God's ways while they may not be your ways, are perfect, they are just, and they are exactly what we need for our edification and his glorification, okay? So that's kind of what we're going to do this morning. If you're good with that, shake your head up and down. If not, there's a door back there. Uh, feel free to go to it. Somebody might tackle you and force you to stick around. It's, you laugh, but I'm serious. Designated tacklers. All right, uh, here we are. We're going to just jump right into verse 1 through 2. So you get your Bibles, your apps, go ahead. You can follow along because then you can highlight stuff and circle stuff. Uh, fun fact, you can write in your Bible. You don't go to hell for it. It's not blasphemous. Definitely okay to write it. You can even doodle in your Bible. It is okay. Uh, otherwise, right here on the screen. Um, verse 1 through 2, if you don't know what's happening, Pastor Kevin, I feel like I just walked into Avengers Endgame an hour into the movie. I don't know what you're talking about. That's okay. You don't need to. This sermon can exist independently of anything that happened in chapter 21, 22, 23, 24. Okay? It can. All right? But I'll give you a little bit of some information on it as we go along. Okay? Uh, so three days after Festus, that's the guy who's kind of uh, the Roman appointed governor over the area. You have to remember at this time during the first century, Palestine, which is now modern day Israel, so this area of Palestine that the Jews or the Hebrews lived in, it was under Roman occupation because the Roman Empire was vast. They allowed the Jews to kind of govern themselves, but they did appoint people to occupy the area. So it was normal to have Roman appointed officials that would kind of make sure that things were in line with Roman conduct, all right? They didn't want to have outbreaks or insurrections, which happened all the time because the Jews just did not want to be underneath Roman authority. So you got this cat named Festus who took over for a dude named Felix who we heard about in the earlier chapters of 20. Uh, he got rolled out because he was wicked and corrupt. Oddly enough, this guy is very similar. So Festus arrived in the Providence. That's in this area, because he got appointed. He went up to Jerusalem. You will always go up to Jerusalem uh, because geographically, Jerusalem is a higher elevation. It has nothing to do with north, south, east, and west. You just go up to Jerusalem, and you always go down from Jerusalem. Uh, and he came from Caesarea, which is north. That's where his palace was. That's where the governor's palace was. It was a beautiful thing. We actually looked at it last, uh, the last week. Now, the chief priests, these are Jewish authorities. These would be the guys that are kind of like Congress, all right? You got 
uh, Democrats and you got Republicans. Well, back then you would have Pharisees and you would have the Sadducees. And these two together, just like how they make up the Congress, well, these two groups together make up what they call the Sanhedrin. They're the ruling council of the Jewish people. They rule religiously, not just politically. Okay. So the chief priests and the leaders of the Jews presented their case to Festus as he showed up in their town against Paul. So they see the new guy. Hey, hey, new guy. We got some stuff to tell you that we don't like. Fun fact, whenever you show up, if you're like a traveling pastor or, or you go to a new job or anything, the first person that comes up to you and complains about everybody, that's the one you watch out for. <laughs> Let me tell you everything that's wrong here. Great, so it's pretty much you, right? All right, great, let's move on. Uh, so that brings us to our first point, okay? Our first point that we're going to look at this morning based off of the text, these first two verses, is that God hardens the heart of the unrepentant. So we're going to look at God hardened the heart of the unrepentant. Let me give you an understanding of why we pull this from the text. You've got to understand a little bit about the background. Uh, Paul rolled into Jerusalem in chapter 21. He actually rolled in a little bit north of Jerusalem and came down. Uh, Paul had finished his third missionary trip. He had been traveling throughout the region of what is now modern-day Turkey and through Greece, the Mediterranean. He had been encouraging churches, planting churches, getting beat, planting churches, getting slandered, planting churches, getting beat some more, and planting more churches. Doesn't that sound fun? Who wants to be a missionary? Uh, so that's what Paul was doing. He gets all done. Um, he rolls into Jerusalem. He's like, listen, I want to go to Rome. That's really my goal is to go to Rome. He's never been to Rome. There's a new church buttoning in Rome, new believers in Rome. He wants to visit. He wants to encourage. Paul has a heart for lost people. Um, if you don't have a heart for lost people, you will do terrible in ministry because people are annoying. So you must love them and want to see them saved to serve them faithfully. Okay. So Paul's like, hey, listen, I want to go to Rome, but I want to stop in Jerusalem because they're, they're under a, a time. Of, of suffering. The church is growing, but is financially weak. Um, there's a famine in the area, and Paul is saying, hey, I've collected some money. I want to go see my brothers in Jerusalem first. When he gets there, he's not accepted well because there's a lot of legalism in the church. He ends up trying to pacify the people in the city. That backfires on him, and he shouldn't have done it anyways. He should have stuck to his guns. He ends up having a riot. He appeals to the rioting people. They want to beat him some more. He gets rescued by Roman people. Uh, he appeals to some more people, gets some more beatings and some more murder plots, ends up escaping by the skin of his teeth uh, under the cover of darkness by the Roman officials to get out of the area, ends up locked up uh, for two years in Caesarea by the Felix, the cat that was before him. And I say all that to say the idiots that have been doing this to Paul for the last two years are the same idiots we read about in verses 1 and 2. The same idiots that want to continue to murder him and slander him and persecute him and gossip about him and destroy him. These are the same guys. They haven't stopped for two years. They've tried to destroy him emotionally. For two years, they've tried to destroy him publicly, personally, slander his reputation, destroy him mentally, destroy him emotionally, um, and even, obviously, physically, as we're going to see, they try another murder plot. Same dudes for two years. I think, before we really dig deep in this, we just got to recognize right out the gates that that ain't normal behavior. Can we just agree collectively that um, two years of incessant harassment is not necessarily the norm. I think anyone in this congregation this morning, anyone here, I think a lot of us, we have had people kind of come against us, right? We've had people that haven't liked us. They talk bad about us. Maybe you've been slandered a bit. But for most of us, as time passes, usually it scales back a little, doesn't it? Like, it's rough, but we kind of know, all right, this too shall pass, right? Like in two years, they forgot about you. They have enough of a life and enough of some normalcy and healthiness in their bodies that they move on to other things like their own life or other people. Um, it's not normal for an individual to continue unprovoked personal attacks against someone. That's just, that's not the norm. Not for, not for this long. I mean, don't get me wrong, it happens, but it's not common. 
what we're seeing here, you should just red flag, this isn't normal. Um, and this is why I think a lot of us read the Bible so terribly and we think we don't get anything out of it because we, we don't actually look objectively and say, is this normal behavior? Because if you do, you're like, wow, this is kind of odd. I wonder why. And we dig into it, okay? So when we read our Bibles, read it as if these are real people because guess what? They are real people, okay? Fun fact for you, real people, history, all right? Um, we got a group of guys here who will not stop no matter how much time has passed, no matter how far away Paul is, no matter what he's moved on to do, these guys are hell-bent on destroying Paul. Best way I can describe it. Right? Um, and what's really sad about this situation isn't so much the unrelenting attacks uh, on Paul, um, but rather what's really sad about this situation is the condition of the people's hearts behind these attacks. That's what I find to be the most sad in this situation. Um, see, these aren't just, and I need to make this distinction very clear as we talk about God hardening the heart of the unrepentant. See, these people that are doing this, these aren't just professing unbelievers. Now, first off, um, what I love about, and I say this a lot, what I love about Ford Church is we, we have people here that are not uh, saved by God's grace. I know that some of you here today, you're still trying to figure out what is Jesus all about. Man, praise God. You're in the right place. I'm glad you're here, dude. We love having you. We thank you and we welcome you as our guest and we love you and we want you to know a Savior who has died for you, who is pursuing you, who wants a relationship with you, okay? Um, and for a lot of people, Forge Church has been the place where they first discovered who Jesus is. This is not a church that, that when we planted it a year and 10 months ago, was a whole bunch of like Christians that came in and were like, dude, we all love Jesus. We know, how to, we know how to read the Bible. This was people rolling the door being like, who's this Jebus that I've been hearing about? I'd like to discuss him more. Like, that's, that's what we were, right? Um, so a lot of us, we, we had no background at all before we came here. I mean, myself, I only got saved nine years ago by God's grace. Uh, so what we're talking about here is not people like this. We're not talking about people that are professing unbelievers. They haven't heard the gospel. They haven't heard the call to repent. These individuals are not ignorant, lost men that have been living in the world. These are not people that are blind to their sins. Um, these men, these wicked men, they are religious men. All right, I just want to make that super clear. These are men who are not just religious, but they're like the super religious people. These are religious leaders. These are men who, because of what we know from the culture and how uh, someone became a part of the Sanhedrin or a Pharisee or a Sadducee, a religious leader, we would know that these are people who spent their early life studying the scriptures, memorizing the scriptures. These are people who now, as they've gotten older, teach the scriptures, make their living off the public proclamation of the scriptures. These are men who are in the word all the time, but they are not men who are of the world. I mean, so uh, of the word, okay? That's who these cats are. Um, not only that, but dang, I mean, these guys have been presented the gospel by some of the greatest men of faith. We talked about that a few, a few months back, um, that these guys had the opportunity to hear the gospel presented through some of the greatest apostles that have ever lived. Peter presented the gospel to him, right? Paul presents the gospel to him. <clears throat> I'm going to assume because they're in Jerusalem, the brother of Jesus, James, who ends up leading the church, he presented the gospel to him. I believe that some of these guys, based on the, on, on, on the time period, they had heard the gospel from the mouth of Jesus Christ himself. These cats, they're not ignorant, right? Um, these are men who use God and his scriptures to make themselves look good, all the while they are living completely opposed to God with wicked hearts. Their condition is sad, but it's not just sad. Rather, I'd say that their condition is absolutely, positively terrifying. It's a terrifying condition that they're in. Because these men, they have set their hearts against God. I would say they've set their faces. The scripture would say they've, they've set their face against God and hardened themselves to God. Right? Um, because these are guys who have rejected correction. They've rejected truth for so long. We see this hardness forming in their hearts. And this hardness, as we look through these from, verse, from chapter 21 all the way through to the end of chapter uh, 26, these guys uh, have continued to get worse in their condition, worse as they've continued to reject conviction, harder and harder. 
I like to use the term hardness of heart. That's not something I'm just making up and trying to give some little picture. Uh, The Old Testament frequently uses the term hardened heart. They talk about Pharaoh throughout Exodus whose heart was hardened by God. Uh, We hear about different kings throughout different empires who had their hearts hardened. Uh, We hear in the New Testament that term used frequently as well, the hardness of heart. And we're going to read a little bit about that here in a second. Um, I think the best way we can define a hardness of heart or a hardened heart is it is defined as an obstinate or a calloused heart, um, a heart that ref- that refuses to respond to God, a heart that refuses to obey God, um, a heart that is blind to the value of the gospel, a heart that refuses to embrace Christ. That's that's the kind of heart we're talking about here. Not just, you know, hey, man, I'm, I'm here today. I'm kind of seeking God. I'm open. That's not a hardened heart. You get what I'm saying? You see the clear difference, right? I want you to get what we're talking about, okay? You guys tracking with me? Yeah? You're tracking? Yes? North and south. Make it happen. I love it. I'm back. You know, when I said that when I was guest speaking, they looked at me like I was an idiot, and I was greatly offended. I'm like, you guys tracking north and south. They're like, oh, what? No idea what he's talking about. I will never guess speak anywhere else again. <sighs> All right. So, I mean, that's where these dudes are at. Um, that's what this hardness of heart, it's driving, it's fueling the, the actions of two years of resentment and hatred towards Paul. Uh, and if the reality of this condition that they're in, if that's not fearful enough, um, it only intensifies. The fear only, only gets greater when, when you realize This is crazy, that God himself will harden the heart of the individual. It's a terrifying thought. Um, You're like, "Uh, Pastor Kevin, I believe you're wrong. That is not true. God would never do that. He's a loving God. He is a loving God. He's also just. Uh, Let me just prove my point here. I'm going to read you 10 verses of scripture from the book of Romans. What's really cool is the book of Romans was written to a church in the city of Rome. You're like, oh, man. Ah! Philippians was written to a church in Philippi, Galatians to a church in Galatia, Ephesians to a church in Ephesus. You're like, it's starting to click, isn't it? You're like, these are all letters. Yeah, they are, absolutely, positively. Rome was written to a church in Rome. Where did Paul want to visit? He wanted to visit Rome during this time. All right? So this is a letter that Paul writes about hardness of heart to a church in Rome, and Paul has experienced that very thing here. I think he is writing not just through divine inspiration, but also from a little bit of personal experience and some wisdom, is he not? Right? So check this out. Here's what he writes. I highlighted the ones that kind of really drive this home. So if you're following along, you want to underline these in your Bible, circle them, draw an angry face next to them, feel free to do whatever you want. For although they knew God, they did not honor him. Paul's speaking about these people indirectly. They did Because they knew God, they didn't honor God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. See, right? Claiming to be wise, they became fools. I know some of those dudes. Um, and exchanged the glory. I was one of them. And exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals. That's just idol worship, okay? Therefore, what, here, what do we see here? God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts. So God has given them over to impurity, to the dishonor of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie. They worshiped and served creature rather than the creator that happens today in New Age spiritualism, all right? Who is blessed forever, amen. This, for this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passion. So he gives them over. You want that? Here it is. For their women exchange natural relations for those that are contrary to nature, the men in likeness, uh, likewise give up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another, men committing shameless acts with men, receiving themselves a due penalty for their So just showing what God gave them over to, okay? And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, he gave them up to their debased mind. That's the scariest thing, to be given over to my flesh. I never want that because I know what my flesh does. Uh, to what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil. Think about it. These guys, when, if you want to know what does it look like when someone has a hardened heart and has been given over by God to their sinful desires, here's the definition of what those people seem to have come out of their life. Unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They're full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliceness. They are gossips. They are slanderers. They're haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Somebody's like, oh, that explains that. Maybe it, maybe it defines you and it's convicting. Praise God. Maybe it helps you understand some of the people around you. Praise God. 
though they know God's righteous decrees that those who practice such things deserve to die. So they know they're not ignorant. They not only do them, but they give approval to those who practice them. See, God hardens the heart of those who choose to walk in rebellion. God hardens the heart of those who continually reject him, even though they know it. Um, Psalm 81.12 reaffirms this. God is speaking here, and he's saying, So I gave them over to the stubbornness of their heart, hardness, to walk in their own devices. It's a terrifying thought. It's absolutely terrifying. Um, and that should be, you know, let, me, let me speak to my non-Christian friends here today. Um, if, you're, if you're concerned about your salvation, you're like, you know what, I'm still checking this out, or, or maybe I thought I was, I was raised Christian, you know, yeah, uh, I, I, I check the box, but you think about your life now, and you're like, maybe, maybe I'm not really walking with Christ. Maybe I really have never received salvation. I've just kind of been going through the motions, which is very typical to uh, this type of community. I mean, we're, we're in the Midwest. Um, it's, it's polite to be called Christian still. Uh, we're one of the few places left where it's still kind of socially acceptable. Um, but there is really no change in your life. You're just kind of going through the motions. It, it, when you look at your life, you might say you're Christian, but you go like, dude, I, I don't think I'm really living it. Like, there's not that joy in that heart of worship. So I want to say this to you, if, that, if that's you today. This point, the scripture should be absolutely sobering to you. It should be crazy sobering to you. It should cause you to have an absolute deep fear of remaining unrepentant, and it should create in you some sort of urgency to repent and believe before God gives you over to your own desires and allows you to choose hardness and then hardens your heart. It, it should be sobering. It should create urgency, and that's okay. By me saying that, I'm not trying to manipulate emotions, but I'm simply speaking the truth. And sometimes when we come face to face with the truth of God, it does cause illicit emotions to come up, and that is okay. And we, we should respond to those. Um, my, my friends, uh, if that's you today, man, I want you to know God loves you, God is pursuing you. Uh, but the longer that you reject truth, the longer you walk in rebellion by being exposed to truth, the harder your heart is going to become. It's just a, that's just how it works, man. And I'm not saying the men here, these, these guys that we're, that we're reading about here in this text, I'm not saying that they're beyond God's ability to save. No one is beyond God's ability to save. Rather, I'm saying that God will and does give people over to their own desires, and he does allow them to choose to walk in a manner which will harden their hearts to the gospel. And he will allow people to die in rebellion to him if that is what they are choosing to do. Okay, um, C.S. Lewis uh, summed this whole concept up, and it's a great way to kind of move on, um, in a book called The Great Divorce. And he wrote this. He said, there are only two kinds of people in the end. Those who say to God, thy will be done, and those who God says in the end, thy will be done. He closes and he says, all that are in hell, choose it. Um, I think that is a very sobering, very uh, blunt way of stating this, but absolutely true. Um, God can and God will harden a heart. We see this large group of men here uh, living that reality. Um, but I want you to understand that this, this act of the hardness of the heart, this hardening of the heart, this is an act that does not happen independently of the individual. Someone doesn't accidentally get a hard heart. That's not something like, whoops, how did that happen? Okay, um, Rather, the hardness of the heart, God hardening the unrepentant person's heart, um, this is a painful consequence that happens due to a continual rejection of God's love, a continual rejection of God's mercy, a continual rejection of God's truth on a regular basis. This is not something that just happens accidentally. Okay? Crap, is that happening to me right now? You're not going to accidentally fall into it. Is there a willing desire in your life where you are constantly rejecting truth? And, and if that's the case, be terrified and repent and believe. That's a great thing to say. It's the most loving thing I could tell you this morning. 
Um, I'm going to skip over some other applications for the sake of time. I'm going to just jump right into uh, verse 3, okay? It's because I like to write extra things and not preach them, obviously. Uh, so verse 3, uh, it says, they, and, and they appealed, asking for a favor against Paul. So here's, here's the wicked dudes, the religious leaders. They're asking for a favor from Festus against Paul. And the favor they're asking says that Festus summoned him to Jerusalem. Because remember, um, while Festus is in Jerusalem with these cats, Paul is still locked up in the governor's mansion, which is a beautiful palace. Um, why did they do this? Because they were, in fact, preparing to ambush along the road to kill him. So they had some dudes. They're like, listen, as soon as he rolls down, drive by. Run by. Be run by. That's a joke. Get it? So run by. Come on. Like, do you see what I did there? Because they didn't have cars. Not drive, so run. Like, nothing? I don't like you all very much sometimes. <laughs> like, I love you because we're Christians, you know, and, and, you know, you're God's created people, but you just hurt my feelings sometimes. Sorry. Yeah, I don't, I don't, nope, it's too late for that. This isn't interactive. <laughs> all right, let's get another round of coffee. Maybe this will pick back up. Um, so here's my, here's my third point. I mean, my second point. Wicked men are slaves to their wicked actions. Wicked men are slaves to their wicked actions. This is, this is just abundantly clear. Like I said, none of these points will build off of each other. Independent, but very, very poignant. Um, so we have a, basically what's happening here in verse 3 is we're seeing that there's another plot to murder Paul. Um, I told you this already happened back in chapter 23. They were going to wait in the shadows uh, when Paul was transferred to a different area. They were going to attack the guards, which that's just stupid. If you are unarmed uh, civilians, don't try to take on the Roman army. But they were going to. They didn't care. They were probably going to die during it, but they were hoping they could kill Paul. Um, the commander of the Roman legions, or the Roman, uh, he was actually the commander of uh, two 200 plus uh, people. He heard about this through Paul's nephew, then decides to get Paul out of there, send him up to the, to the governor in Caesarea by the cover of night. So once again, these men's hearts are so hard that once again, they're still obsessed with murdering Paul and trying to do it again two years later. So I just can't stop driving this home. Two stinking years. Two years these guys have been holding on to rage. Two years they've been hating Paul, two years have passed, and these dudes cannot find it in their wheelhouse to even move on. Two years. They obsess over Paul. Two years they talk about Paul. They slander Paul for two years. They gossip about Paul. These guys are losing sleep over Paul. They're burdened day and night about Paul. Week after week, month after month, year after year, these dudes cannot get their minds to stop obsessing about Paul. They are completely consumed with him to the point that I would argue that these dudes are slaves to Paul, not the other way around. You see what I'm saying? Um, check this out. See, Paul, while this is happening, he's been sleeping fine. He don't need no melatonin. He's good. He, he hasn't been losing sleep. He hasn't been freaking out about it. They're not a burden to him. He's not obsessed with them. He's not frightened by them. He's not dwelling on them. He's not consumed with what they think of him or what they're saying or tweeting about him. Uh, Paul's business is about the ministry and seeing the brothers in Rome eventually. And we know this because nowhere in his letters do we ever see Paul lamenting and falling apart because of obsessive men that can't let things go. Paul's like, dude, I'm good. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do me, follow Jesus, preach the gospel. These guys could not say the same thing. Uh, and it's almost comical, I think. Like, these cats have been given over, as we saw in that first point, to their own desires and lusts. Uh, their hearts have become hard. Their faces are fixed against God, particularly, uh, well, through and his people, particularly Paul, um, and these guys, I, I believe, because I know dudes like this in real life, um, these guys think that they are some sort of horrific plague to Paul, but in reality, Paul is a plague to them, right? Paul's a plague to them. 
They can't get away from him. He's just like, deuces, I'm going to sleep. I'm in the palace, you know? Um, for two years, and the next coming years, forever how long, their lives are controlled by Paul because they're wickedly obsessed with him. They become slaves to their sinful nature. Their hatred for Paul controls them so much that they have no rest, they have no freedom, they have no peace in their life at all. The very things they're trying to strip Paul of, they themselves don't have. Their actions to take the peace away from Paul has removed any peace in their life. Their desire to strip hope from Paul's life has robbed them of any hope. Their desire to destroy his world has made their world absolutely unlivable. Wicked men are slaves to their wicked actions. Uh, my friends, this is going to happen to you at some extent. I think maybe some of us today, we're currently experiencing slander. Some of us have experienced bullying. Maybe you're doing that right now. Maybe uh, hatred from someone. And for too long, you're sitting here today, and as you think about this, you've, you've realized, man, I feel crippled by what's happening to me. I feel crippled by the persecution, the slandering, the bullying, whatever it might be. Um, maybe you've been consumed with it. You felt powerless to their words, um, their actions against you. Maybe you felt as if this person is somehow powerful and in control, and maybe you think that you're the victim of their, their wickedness. But friends, let me shed some light on this situation. If you are a Christian today, let me say this. It is not the Christian who is ever the victim. It is not the Christian who is a slave. It is not the Christian who is burdened. It is not the Christian who is miserable. Rather, it is the wicked man who in their unjustified hate towards the Christian has become a slave to their own making. Okay, That's just the reality. And that's a freedom you need to experience if you are in Christ, if you haven't recognized this yet. And it, it's going to come from understanding what is happening in their life spiritually and emotionally and the freedom that you have. See, the Christian rightly understands that their hope is in God. This is why we are not the slave when people do this to us. They are. So I'm speaking to my Christian friends here. Um, and I want you to realize we can have this freedom as Christians because our hope is in God and God alone. The Christian rightly understands that only God controls their destiny. Nobody else has any ability to alter God's destiny for your life. That's just not possible. That, is, that, that implies that somehow wicked individuals or just creation has some sort of control over the creator. And that's just not how it works. The creator is in control of creation, okay? So no one has control over our destiny. The Christian rightly understands where their value and their worth comes from. So therefore, no one can try to dis no one who attempts to destroy your earthly reputation can ever rob you of your value or your worth because your value and your worth is not in your social media presence. It's not in your friend group. It's not in the reputation others have of you. Your value and worth lies squarely in the fact that you were saved by God's grace, reconciled to the Father through the Son, and that is the sole source of your value and your worth, not your appearance, not what someone says about you, not what someone writes about you, not what someone reviews about you. Your value and your worth is in Christ and Christ alone. That is why you cannot ever be controlled or feel powerless by a simple person who speaks some stupid words unjustifiably, amen? Do you get what I'm saying? Like, come on, that was good. Like, don't even, come on, that's freedom, Act like, oh, yeah, I knew that. Don't stop it. I'm like, amen. It preaches to me. I need this so much. Um, man, my guys, when you grasp this truth, when you pair that with the sad state that your accuser is in, when you realize that they don't have the peace you have, they don't have the hope you have, they don't have the comfort you have, when you realize and you rightly understand that that, that individual is a slave to their own wicked emotions, I think you're able to be like Paul, who says he endured all of this, and he counts it as joy. Like, if you don't get that, and Paul says, I count it all joy, you're like, you're sadistic and kind of weird. We could not be friends, Right? But when you, when, when you rightly understand this, as Paul did, you're like, Psh, I count it joy because when I see the depthness and the hardness and the lostness and the slavery that the people that are attacking me in, and I, and I pair that with the joy and the peace that I have in Christ, I go, man, 
When these situations happen, it doesn't cause me to come down here. It caused me to come up here and have joy because I realize that, but by the grace of God, there go I, that that used to be me. So in the persecution, I go, praise God, because I used to be like that. And I say praise God because even though I used to be like that, when I was in a position where I was lost and lost people were attacking me, it just crippled me. And now I go, praise God, you're better. Count it all joy, my friends. Count it all joy. The victim is not the Christian. The victim is not Paul. The true victim is the one who lives as a slave to their flesh. The real victim is the one who is consumed by their sin. So my friends take hope because that is not the Christian. Amen? All right. Let's move along. Verses 4 through 8. We're cruising. Here we go. Uh, Festus. Again, fun fact. Mary Jane, looking for a baby name, Bennett. It would be hilarious, though, right? Like, if you just maybe make it his middle name, her middle name. Because nobody really knows me. I, I screwed up my kids' middle names. I named one Marvel. I named the other one Solo, Right? I was this close to naming it Hulk. But I'm just saying, nobody cares about middle names. You can do something stupid like that, right? Just consider it. (laughs) Consider it. Let it marinate, convict you. You never know. Amberly Festus Cook? No? Okay. All right, let's move along. Verse 4 through 8. Festus, however, answered that Paul should be kept at Caesarea. So they said, remember, we want to bring him down to Jerusalem so we can kill him. Ha, ha, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Um, and that, so Paul says, you know, hey, let's keep him in Caesarea, and he himself was going to go there shortly. Obviously, he wants to get back to his palace and enjoy the beautiful, uh, the beautiful place. Uh, therefore, he said, let those of you who have authority go down with me and accuse him. Because obviously, there was other people. He's like, listen, you have no business coming in. You're just little, little uh, uh, yippy dogs that are barking and yipping at my ankle. Uh, but anybody that actually has authority, why don't you come on down? And if he has done anything wrong, you can talk about it. So when he had not spent more than eight or ten days among them, he went down to Caesarea. The next day, he was seated at the tribunal. He commanded Paul to be brought in. Uh, when he arrived, so that's Paul, the Jews who had come down from Jerusalem stood around him, and they brought many serious charges. We're going to talk about that. Serious charges. And then this next part, that they were not able to prove. <laughs> many serious charges that are completely unprovable. Right? The glove don't fit. you got to quit. Um, then Paul made his defense. I love Paul's defense as Luke summarizes it. The author Luke, who was with him, he writes, neither against the Jewish law, nor against the temple, nor against Caesar have I sinned in any way. It's just like, it's the, it's, it ain't even a long defense. He's just like, I didn't do it. Haven't we done this before? Here's my defense. I didn't do it. Well, what's your defense? Here's all these serious charges. That's great. I didn't do it. <laughs> he's, just, he's not, he's not freaking out. He's not crying out like, gosh, hi. How do I handle this? He's like, I didn't do it. Can I go back to my room? He's working on this letter. It's going to be in the Bible someday. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think that's how it works. <laughs> so that brings us to our third point. Faithfulness does not prevent accusations. Faithfulness does not prevent accusations. When I say faithfulness, what I'm referring to is a biblical faithfulness. A person that is being faithful to the scriptures, being faithful to a walk with Christ. Okay, That's very different than just being Christian, okay? You can be saved by God's grace, but be living in an unfaithful manner, okay? You can be saved by God's grace and not be faithful in all walks of your life. That was me. When I first went into youth ministry and when I, when I was speaking, I won't use the term pastoring, speaking at another church in town, I was not faithful. I was a Christian, but I wasn't faithful. By God's grace, um, he worked in my life, and I can proudly stand here as your pastor and say, since God has, has let me have this ministry, there has been faithfulness, okay? That doesn't mean sinlessness, right? Because I sin, but I can say faithful, walking out faithful leadership, faithfulness in, as a husband, as a father, faithfulness as a disciple of Christ, okay? So I want you to understand, just because you're being faithful in your walk with Christ, it does not prevent accusations against you, and uh, this ain't new. Like, if you've been here even, like, three months, we ain't breaking new ground with this concept, okay? This is something that I talk about a lot. Um, But it's good to be reminded that even when you're walking faithfully, you're still going to be persecuted if you are following Christ faithfully. Um, So here we got Paul. He's no stranger to persecution. He's being unfairly, would we agree that this is unfair slander? 
Can we just, would we mutually agree that this is unfair? If you don't, there's something wrong with you. Well, no, no, then you deserved it. You're a horrible person. Um, but right, this is kind of unfair. He, we, got a, we got a faithful dude. He's walking faithfully with God. Um, and he is experiencing slander and accusations that have absolutely no grounds. We're told in verse 7 that they were not able to prove anything. Um, and that's, that's really the part that I want to expand on a bit here. But first off, I think it's unique to notice when you look at not just the text this morning, these 12 verses, but when you, if you go back to chapter 21 when this whole thing really started to develop, and if you go all the way through to verse 28 when he ends up, spoiler alert, if you don't want to know what happens, close your ears, spoiler alert, he ends up in Rome. Anybody just, did I just give it away? You're like, I was, oh, now I don't have to read it. Know the ending, you ruined it for me. I'm going to read a different book. Um, but if, <coughs> oh, man. You guys, I think I'm funny sometimes. And the fact that some of you guys don't, it really bothers me a lot. Because I, I, think, I think I'm a little bit winsome. Um, I don't know. Thank, you guys keep me humble because I can never feel good about myself. Ah, that was low, right? Like that was just, uh, yeah. Oh, I don't know why nobody ever comes back to this church. <laughs> I don't care. I'm having fun. Okay. Um, what were we talking about? <laughs> uh, yeah, okay. So if you go back and you look at the chapters here, <laughs> You're going to notice something really unique, and I promise you this. I I'm not going to be wrong. N not even if you just go back to chapter 21, but if you look at any single letter that Paul ever writes to any single church he ever visits or writes to, you're never going to see that he says that his situations that he found himself in is unfair. We can mutually agree that this is very unfair, but never once will you ever see Paul say that it's unfair. Fact check me on it. Please, read your Bible. You're not going to hear that. Um, he never screams unfair during this two-year process. And it's not because Paul is super holy and a saint like the Catholic Church says he is. Um, it's not because he's some super holy dude. Rather, Paul never screams unfair because I believe Paul has a right understanding of what fairness and unfairness really is that we absolutely don't. I don't think we grasp what is truly fair. I don't think we grasp what is truly unfair at all. Paul does. That's why he never says it. See, here's the deal. This is going to sound really odd. This is going to sound shocking. This is going to offend some people, and that's really cool because I think it's going to change your, your thinking a little bit, but I believe this to be 100% true. I don't believe that the Christian should ever claim that anything that ever happens to them, here's the bomb, is unfair. I don't believe that the Christian should ever open up their mouth and scream unfair to anything that happens to them. And that seems odd, and I get that. And that seems like a really harsh statement. Um, and you might be like, well, Pastor Kevin, listen, if we're, if we're living faithful and someone else lashes out at us for no reason, they slander us, attack us and our family continually, unrelentingly, like what's happening here with Paul, um, while we're completely innocent, how is this not unfair? Oh, no, 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 let me be clear. It is unfair. I just don't believe we should scream unfair. I'm not saying unfair things can't happen. Quite the contrary. There's a lot of things that happen that are unfair. I don't believe that it is the Christian who should scream that something is unfair, and here's why. If you are a Christian and you're screaming that's not fair, trust me, my friends, you don't want what is fair. You get what I'm saying? You don't want fairness. Not one bit. Don't yell that's unfair because what you don't want is God to give you what is truly fair because I'll tell you what is fair. Mine and yours, complete eternal conscious torment, full wrath of God against you, separation for eternity in hell. That is what's fair. That's fair. Salvation is unfair. Forgiveness of sins is unfair. 
the ability to be able to be in a relationship with God, to, to, to look at the Father in, with all of his wrath and all of his judgment, right? And, and, and have that pass over us and be placed on the Son and then to be welcomed into the Father's presence with open arms. And he goes, you were once my enemy, now sit at my table and eat with me because I love you. That's completely unfair, Do you get what I'm saying? Like the ability to not be given over to the hardness of your heart day one because you're a rebel. That's unfair. To have grace every day is unfair. To receive mercy is unfair. You don't want fairness. I weep at the thought of being given what I truly deserve. How dare I ever shake my fist and say unfair. Because I don't want God to say, you want fair? Okay, I'm sorry, Lord, I don't. No, I don't. I don't want what's fair. And if you grasp that, I think you live differently. We have created a culture of evangelical American 21st century Christianity that screams, unfair, unfair. Lord, bless me with this car. Bless me with this thing. Let me speak the power of my words into existence and manifest my destiny. And God, if if you don't heal me of this and do this, this is... Are you serious? Y'all don't want what's fair. You don't want what's fair. It's, it's absolutely ridiculous. I, I would say that we need to live simply with a posture where we continue to thank God daily for grace and for mercy. And we, instead of a posture of trying to figure out what's fair and unfair in our life, we simply live a life of thankfulness that brings God glory in absolutely everything that we do. Um, it's not a matter of unfair or, un, or, or fair when accusations come at us. It's a matter of how do we handle it when it happens. Okay? And Paul endures all of this accusations very well. Um, not because he has some secret knowledge or some special holiness. I think it's one, he has a right understanding of fair and unfair, but also Paul prepared in advance for this type of accusation. It's not that Paul knew this was going to happen. I think he had an understanding that people were going to accuse the faithful believer. So he prepared himself in advance by living a life that is above reproach. And if that word sounds weird, let me explain this. Um, here's what I mean. People are going to try to slander you. People are going to dis- try to destroy your, your Christian testimony. They're going to try to destroy your Christian reputation if, if you are in Christ today. I um, mean, maybe you've experienced this. And I would say while the accusations are lies, the question becomes not so much are they lies or are they not lies, because it's going to happen regardless. I think the question becomes, is there evidence in your life that could make it seem like these accusations are true? Are there things in your life that could give credence to these false accusations? See, Paul understood that, so he lived a life that was above reproach, a life that was unblemished, not sinless, but a life that looked in a manner that he was living out what he believed. I'll, I'll give you a great example. Um, prior to starting the Forge Church, when I was trying to figure out ministry and, and, and my role in it and my, my marriage and, and as, a, as a father, as a disciple, um, as a gym owner, as a, a church future planner, um, I was extremely unwise. You'll notice that you won't find any videos of me preaching before I planted Ford's church. That's intentional. They might be good stuff from them, but I also know where my heart was. I also know that I was living very unwise and very foolish. Okay? That's where I would say I was not being faithful. So you won't find anything out there. You can look. You ain't going to find it. If you do find it, let me know so I can delete it. <laughs> I don't like those ones, man. I, I just look. I'm like, you're a stupid idiot, Kevin. Saved by God's grace. Um, But I was really unwise with how I lived and very unwise with how I spoke. So, like, for me, it was no big deal for me to possibly, like, get a ride home from another female, from the gym or the church. I mean, um, if my wife friend was at the gym and while I would be 100% innocent um, and I jump in the car and I ride home with them, Say, oh, that's not a big deal. You know, we do it all the time, but here's the deal. By doing that, I'm simply giving ammo to someone who wants to accuse me of something nefarious or something inappropriate, right? 
I'm like, well, Pastor Kevin, I had this conversation the other night with someone when they heard about this. Because see, what we've done now is as I planted this church, I said, man, I need to, I need to be so careful with every single thing I do, more careful than anyone else if my life is going to be under public scrutiny, right? And I would just say that's good practice for any of you all, especially men who are trying to walk out biblical faithfulness. So there's a, a rule that I implemented in the household that my wife didn't ask me. I said, honey, I will never get in a car with another female ever. It's just not going to happen. And she very much graciously agreed with it, but it's caused, it's, it's, we've had moments of tension in our marriage because she's like, can you just get a ride home with Mary Jane? You're both at the church building together. There's no problem with it. And I'm like, well, I know that would be convenient, but sweetie, I'm just not going to. I'm not going to do it. We're friends. Nobody here would probably think twice, but what happens when someone else in town sees me riding a car with someone that's not my wife? It can give credence to those accusations. So in that manner, I'm not living above reproach. You have to realize that wicked people don't care about what's right or wrong. They care about destroying you. So I'm going to make all the effort to inconvenience, and sometimes that means my, my poor, lovely, lovely wife has to pack up 18 children, get in the minivan, drive a mile down the road to give her stupid husband a ride home because he ran out of gas in his car. And I'm not going to ask the person next to me because they're a female, and I just, I'm not going to do that. It doesn't mean I'm perfect. I've learned from mistakes. Do you understand what I'm saying? I'm not saying I've, I've always been so righteous. Like, I've been stupid and an idiot and put myself in a really bad places, and I'm learning from texts like this. I need to be above reproach because when the accusations come for being faithful, I don't want them to have grounds. It doesn't mean they're not going to come. It just means, am I living in a manner such that they have no grounds? Do you get what I'm saying? Up and down. You get it? Let that sink in. Talk about it at your, at your life groups this week because that's a, that's a tough one, okay? Um. I, I want you to grasp this concept, the slander and the attacks, the gossip that you receive will always be in proportion to the hate that people have against you. Do you get that? The more they hate you, the more the attacks will happen. The more they hate you, the worse the accusations will happen. Okay? They hated Paul so much that it lasted two years. That's in proportion to the hate that they have against you in their hearts. All right? Um, John Calvin says this about um, the world's words towards the believer. Now, again, this is towards the Christian, okay? So Calvin says this, and this is almost always the estate of servants of Christ. So he's talking about Christians here. Wherefore, they must be the more courageous to pass valiantly, I love that word, to pass valiantly through evil reports and through good reports. Neither let them think it strange to be evil reported of where they have done good. When you do good, don't think it's strange that there's going to be evil reported of you. Furthermore, let us note that wicked men can never be bridled. Right? Think of like a horse and a bridle. They can't be controlled. But they will speak evil of good men and will impudently slander them. For they, these wicked men, resemble the nature of Satan by whose spirit they are led. <laughs> like, amen, John Calvin. That could preach. Um, so here's the deal, man. You can't prevent it, but you can live in a manner where you're above reproach, uh, where they will have nothing to put against you. Um, let's close as we read verse 9 through 12. This is probably my shortest of the points. Uh, but Festus, wanting to do the Jews a favor, replied to Paul, are you willing to go up to Jerusalem and be tried before me there in these charges? Paul replies, this is where Paul just gets frustrated, and he doesn't sin, but you can just tell he's frustrated. He's like, dude, I'm standing at Caesar's tribunal where I got it, where I ought to be tried. I've done nothing wrong to the Jews. Even yourself know this very well. If I did anything wrong, if I'm deserving of death, I'm not trying to escape the death. Paul welcomes it. He goes, but if there's nothing of what these men accuse me of, then no one can give me up to them. I appeal to Caesar. And then after Fester confers with his counsel, Festus, uh, he replies, you have appealed to Caesar. To Caesar, you will go. And I think this is an awesome point for us to close on this morning and a wonderful way to dismiss us into the world for the rest of our week. Um, Paul has lost it. He's expressing his frustration. He's bounced around for over two years. Nobody had the spine and the position to step up and make a call, to make a decision. They're humming, they're hying, and once again, they try to send him back to Jerusalem to square one. He's got, they want him to go back four chapters in the book of Acts, and he says, fine, y'all want to play stupid games? Let's play stupid games. I want to go talk to Caesar. And they have to let him because that's a right as a Roman citizen. Okay, he goes, uh, you know, enough is enough. Thanks for the hospitality. Love the palace, but I'm done. We're heading to Rome. That's where I wanted to go in the first place. Let's make it happen, Captain. Oh, yeah, and you, it, to make this happen, you'll have to escort me in Roman ships with Roman guards and, and protection and swords and all that great stuff.
So it's interesting if you think about it. I mean, it, we stay at the beginning. Paul had a burden on his heart, as we told you guys this morning, to travel to Rome, right? I think we established that. He wanted to visit the church in that city. But here's the deal. There was no plan on how Paul was going to get there. All he knew, as I told you earlier, is he wanted to visit Jerusalem first, right? That's all he knew. He just wanted to get to Jerusalem, and then from there, he'd figure out how to get to Rome. Um, if you look at this, God ordained all of this. Paul's on his way to Rome now. As we close chapter 25 or we get to the middle of it, Paul's going to be heading out to Rome. Um, God ordained everything that we've heard here this morning. All the sins these people chose to do, the hatred against Paul, the indecisiveness of the governor, all of these things led up to the point where God arranged, he, didn't, he, he is not culpable to the sin, but he arranged the sinful actions of these wicked men to get Paul into a position where he would be escorted by soldiers to Rome at the God-appointed time through the God-appointed means, and all of this was sovereignly arranged by God to fulfill his perfect purpose and accomplish his perfect will. And I think it's unique. Like, here we are as we close this out with all these horrible things happening. We realize that Paul's going to get to Rome, and it was all done in a way that God ordained, which means all these things happened to fulfill God's purpose. And Paul is going to find himself in Rome just how he always wanted, but granted, it's going to be as a prisoner. Um, but he seems very fine with that as we read the rest of his letters. Um, he felt called by the Holy Spirit to go to Rome. He wanted to visit the church. And God ensured he got to Rome. God ensured that all he desired happened because it was in accordance with his will. Uh, but the way that Paul got there and his life once he arrived in Rome was probably quite different than what he expected it to be, right? Like Paul didn't arrive under his own power. He was brought in chains. He didn't come as an apostle to the church. He came as a prisoner to Rome, <laughs> right? Um, he didn't come the way that he planned, but he came the way God planned. And his time there and the nature of his ministry was probably extremely different than he expected it would be. But I fully believe, based on God's sovereignty, that it was exactly the way God wanted it to be. It just looked different than what he could possibly even imagine. So I think there's a beautiful application as we, as we close uh, and we look at this uh, point. Whether you're here today as a Christian, whether you're here today still seeking and trying to figure it out, this applies to, to both groups that are sitting here this morning. Um, I want you to understand that God's methodology is not your methodology, okay? Um, the way that he chooses to, to work in your life is not always the way that you might want him to work. And I want this to be very clear. It's not our place to demand how he works. Rather, it is our place to trust that his methods are perfect. That's a hard thing to grasp. Okay? Um, we need to understand and trust that his methods are far wiser. They are more beneficial for our ultimate good and his ultimate glory than how we would choose to do things. Okay? That's an element of trust, and I get that, guys. Because sometimes you look at your life like, this is chaotic. Sometimes it's chaotic because of the sinful choices we make. Sometimes it is simply chaotic because what we see as chaos, God sees as a perfectly ordained method to achieve his glory in your life. And that might look like cancer. It might look like hurt. It might look like chronic pain. It might look like hurt in family and divisions. It might look like all sorts of aches and a loss of a job and financial discouragement. Um, but I want you to understand that God is working together for your good. And sometimes your good is to get brought so low that you have to cry out to him for salvation. Praise God when that happens. That's my story. And sometimes your ultimate good as a believer is to be stripped of things that are keeping you from loving him more. Okay? Sometimes your ultimate good is to get to where he wants you to be, but the methods that you choose are not going to bring about the greatest amount of glory. My friends, God is good. He is so much wiser and can see far more into the future than we can through our limited eyes, and we need to be okay with God answering prayers in a manner that looks different than what we think. Um, man, Paul wanted Rome, and God gave Paul Rome, but it was through two years of persecution, a travel delay, um, a shipwreck, which we're going to see in a few chapters, house arrest, which we close with in chapter 28, but it was the way that brought God the maximum amount of glory, and if we truly care about God's glory more than we care about our personal comfort, we will find joy and we will find peace in his methodology. The question is, what do you care more about? The glorification of God and his kingdom or our personal comfort? Let me pray.
you pray for us? Um, Lord, I thank you so much for a chance to be able to uh, read your word, to teach it to these people. I thank you for the grace this congregation gives me to, to lead them. I thank you for the, the mercy that you give us. Um, I thank you for using an inadequate, untrained, unskilled, uh, sinful person like myself. I thank you for giving me courage to share my past and things that are not flattering. But in that, would we learn from my mistakes, but also never elevate me to be anything special. Uh, Father, there is nothing in my life that that dictates that I am some holy, perfect model. Uh, Lord, I simply want to be a good disciple of you um, and let the church constantly understand that. Um, let not me be talked about or my words, but let you be talked about in your words. May you be glorified. May you be famous. Uh, may we decrease so you can increase. And uh, for those who are struggling today um, under persecution, slander, gossip, and hate, may you give them confidence to walk out today knowing that there is hope in Christ. If they don't know you, would they turn to you with urgency as they fear the hardening of their heart? If they do know you, may they walk in new confidence knowing that, that it's the wicked who are slaves, not the Christian. Um, I thank you so much for the faithful application, the faithful teaching uh, here at this church. We love you so much. Uh, and we ask this all in your son's name. Amen. Thank you.